Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to the third in a series of talks by our postdoctoral fellow at the ASU Institute for Humanities Research, Dr. Namdi Abokwe. So it's our pleasure uh, to welcome you here today again on your return virtual journey to the School of Politics and Global Studies. My name is Victor Peskin. I'm an associate professor in the School of Politics and Global Studies. Namdi has spoken to us at length about the dynamics of corruption uh, in his first two talks, the first on October 28th and the second on November 10th. And if you're interested in receiving a recording of those, just feel free to reach out to us. Uh, so without further ado, I turn it over uh, to Namdi who will be speaking about COVID and corruption. So this is the grand finale of the series. Thank you very much. And just also, just to let you know um, that there'll be a Q&A at the end um, and you can use the Q&A function uh, to kind of state your questions and I will pose them. If you have questions as the talk is proceeding, feel free uh, to type your uh, questions in in advance in the Q&A and uh, we look forward to the Q&A as well. So Namdi, welcome back. Thank you so much uh, for that intro, Victor, and thank you for having me. Um, so yes, we're here, part three, as you mentioned, the grand finale or you know, the main course, if you will, uh, to COVID and corruption. Um, so this week, we're going to be talking about how COVID has impacted political and economic institutions, discussing corruption as a direct consequence of the pandemic and exploring some of the institutional aftermath that has occurred as far as rent seeking and power abuse. Uh, but before I get started, just a quick thank you one more time, one last time to the School of Public Politics and Global Studies for hosting the series, uh, to the Institute for Humanities Research, where I'm a postdoctoral fellow, ASU, uh, and everyone that took the time out to join us today, greatly appreciated. Um, so yeah, let's get into talk three. Uh, I'll quickly go over the first two lectures just to give some context in case you weren't fortunate to, to join us or maybe you didn't join us live. Uh, just a quick overview of what we've been discussing to get to this point. So lecture one discussed corruption generally. What do we mean by corruption? Uh, in it, we typologized and looked at issues of law and normativity um, and found a boundless definition really for corruption, uh, both real and illusory, uh, something that you can't really tie down or export globally um, that has very much nuance to the application and the understanding. Then we move to talk two, which was, you know, what causes corruption, really investigating and explaining how and why corruption, and looking at analysis that whether or not it can be compared, right, I called it compared, uh, corruption's comparative quagmire. Uh, we went through some measurements and examined subjectivity and perception, and again, found some of the same issues that are involved with defining corruption and comparing, explaining, and measuring corruption. And that brings us here today to uh, talk three for COVID and corruption. And we're looking to investigate the relationship between the two, COVID and corruption. How do we get from social pandemic to institutional pathology? And I use the word pathology intentionally, uh, not because of its health connotations in relating to the study of disease, uh, even though it's applicable with COVID, but because of what it signifies institutionally. So when I say institutional pathology, I'm looking at the inability of institutions or the people running those institutions from ceasing to do, from ceasing from doing what they know is harmful, destructive, abusive, and corrupt. That's the pathology. That's the institutional pathology that we're talking about. So with that, let's just get into uh, the talk more specifically. There's a lot to cover, so I'm going to go through uh, many things, but hopefully it gives the breadth and depth of uh, the rest of our conversation and really gives examples of what we mean by corruption and how COVID has impacted. So COVID has taken lives and disrupted our social and economic order at lightning speed, more so than any other crisis that we might have you know, endured in our lifetimes. But before unpacking this linkage, I want to think about punctuated moments for, for a second. Think about times of disequilibrium and disaster and try and understand how they've historically and consistently been wrought with abuse, right? There's actually a famous quote to this end from uh, Baron Rothschild, an 18th century banker. He says, when there's blood in the streets, buy land. And it's a seemingly deplorable notion, uh, but what he's getting at is that there are opportunities in everything, 
particularly in chaos. What is it about chaos that reveals these opportunities, so-called opportunities, right? So with every disaster, with all uncertainty, for some, opportunity arises. Quick travel through history. Sri Lanka in 2004, the tsunamis. After the tsunamis hit, there was $500 million in aid missing, not accounted for. Jump to Katrina in 2005. There's a billion dollars in aid money that was improperly distributed or fraudulently obtained. Again, disaster and opportunity. And anything about more recently in 2010, the earthquakes in Haiti. With all of the aid from the Red Cross and other international groups, people are still asking what happened to the $14 billion, billion with a B, $14 billion in aid that went to Haiti. Some of it landed, but much of it is unaccounted for. With every disaster, why are there so many opportunities for abuse? Let's get started. Now, there's several opinions that might exist, and some of you might have, that COVID caused corruption. I want to quickly dispel those because that is not the dynamic of the relationship that we are interrogating, right? So in 2019, for example, the global, there was a global study that showed deep existing structural problems with frontline healthcare. Um, workers across the world would solicit gifts, extort bribes, steal medicines, abuse their position of power in a variety of ways in the healthcare system. This is all pre-COVID, right? And according to the World Economic Forum, before the pandemic, around $450 billion was lost worldwide to healthcare fraud and corruption. So clearly, COVID did not create these problems, but it, it really clearly intensified them, right? Healthcare abuses have existed, but how has COVID been so impactful? Let's quickly look at a few examples of the result of COVID and corruption, as far as healthcare anyway, to start. Right, so with healthcare, there's an urgency, obviously, to respond uh, with enforcement and oversight and protocols being relaxed just because of the need to either get supplies in or act uh, in an emergency situation. And in some cases, you know, workers might pay for PPEs or overpay. Uh, patients might pay bribes for COVID tests. Travelers might bribe law enforcement for evading quarantines and things like that. Uh, those are those are small social and I don't want to say petty corruption, but lower level corruption than what we're really trying to get at with this talk and with the series of talk talks. We're looking at something more institutional. So the impact that COVID, COVID has had is it's been an accelerant that has stoked the already burning embers of corruption. Right? It's really been a pilot switch, or not even a kerosene to the to the match. Right? It just lights it on fire. So this is not a let's blame COVID exercise or let's point the finger at COVID. Uh, rather, what we want to examine is the moments of extreme crisis and how these moments can expose, what these moments can expose about already fragile and abusive institutional tendencies and modalities that we live with every day that might be hidden or unseen. But now suddenly with a crisis like COVID, they're all coming to the fore. So I'd like you all to think about it this way as we move through some of the examples that I'll provide, right? It's a progression. And I want you to think about moments of disaster or crisis. And you also then think about scarcity and think about how that scarcity shifts to opportunity and how opportunities result in abuse and corruption. So whenever there is a benefit to gaining access to something that is scarce, corruption often becomes attractive. It often becomes a prevailing rationale. So as an example of this, in 1980s in Nigeria, uh, economic, economic opportunities were very scarce. Uh, most employment was low. Uh, there was no manufacturing of business. Oil was the dominant export. But people needed a way to accumulate wealth, to live life. So the logic that became created was to gain wealth through the state. So at the time Babangida was president, he created a system of political settlements where he would just issue government contracts. He would expand his circle. And his idea was, if I'm corrupt, and everybody in my circle is corrupt, and society is corrupt, nobody can point the finger. Nobody can lay blame. Lay blame, uh, lay blame. So in this time, if you had financial windfall in Nigeria or became wealthy, the question wasn't, what did you create? Or what did you invest in? Or did you get a new job? Or what did you inherit? The question was, what contract did you get? 
you must have had a government contract. So that became the prevailing logic to respond to the scarcity of economic opportunity. To create wealth, the logic was corruptly involve yourself in the state to access and leverage these government contracts for your own benefit. So again, we see crisis, scarcity, opportunity, and corruption. So going forward, let's think about one prevailing thought in all settings, which we will see through the examples I'll provide. When opportunities to create wealth are reduced, corruption becomes more and more attractive. We'll start with looking at institutional pathology, as was mentioned in the title of this lecture. So COVID has inserted government and public institutions directly into the logic of economic vitality in very impactful ways, right? Governments around the world now are forced to play a larger role in their economies to combat the pandemic and to provide lifelines for businesses and its people. So while this role and this expanded role is crucial, it also creates so many more opportunities for abuse. So a crisis like COVID tests institutions and ability to respond on the one hand, but it also tests the people's trust in the government on the other hand. And this dynamic becomes increasingly salient when we're talking about life and death and where there are medical services that are required in such high demand. So the governments that have been now inserted and implemented in the economic vitality of their citizens and their business and economies, it's a natural response, right? The governments act in these ways without maybe verifying supply chains or determining fair prices or executing proper oversight. But that's not necessarily the main linkage here, right? Yeah, merchants will always find avenues to capitalize and um, peddle faulty products, you know, defective ventilators or poorly manufactured tests or counterfeit medicines, you know, price gouging at its worst. Um, you run out of toilet paper or sanitizer. I mean, I know there was a story where there was a man who hoarded sanitizer, toilet paper, and all of these um, crucial goods and effects in his garage, hoping for a financial windfall by selling them for a higher price. And this is only a slice of what I want to examine, what we want to get at when we think of institutional pathology. Remember, institutions and corruption institutionally, I'm looking at something more established, more procedural, uh, something that's more structured or embedded in politics and economics. Not to say that these other practices socially are irrelevant. They're certainly relevant. And the trickle down from the top is definitely there. But the contestation and the level of examination that we want to explore is institutional pathology at this inter intersectionality of politics and economics. So two quick examples will give some color to the kind of institutional behavior that I'm alluding to. Number one, if we think about Africa, it's become the epicenter for mobile payments, right? Most transactions aren't done, you know, with your credit card or with a checkbook. They're done via text message with, you know, branchless platform, uh, branchless banking, basically. It's a new platform. We know it as, you know, Venmo or any other mobile app, but in Africa, it's been going off for over a decade where you're just texting payments back and forth and you're getting paid that way. Now this platform has also become the primary stream of COVID aid. So it quickly turned into a hotbed for clientelism and corruption because as you need these cash transfers, these are the most immediate ways to get money to the people. They have now become politically manipulated and diverted based on spe specific constituencies um, and based on rewards or punishment for political support. So in Zambia and Uganda, for example, you get COVID aid to respond to the needs of the pandemic. And you deploy this aid through these mobile payments, uh, but instead politicians and civil servants are recalibrating where this aid goes based on whether or not you supported them politically. If you are a political supporter, you get more aid. If perhaps you supported their opponent, you get nothing. And now you see how they leverage something like COVID aid in a way that becomes institutionally impactful as far as politics and economics. There's another example that I have. It's not parallel, but it's similar to realize this intersectionality. So if you are perhaps hearing about this mobile payment mis misappropriation and you're frowning and you think, well, what's going on in Zambia and Uganda, quickly think about the billions of dollars that were made from inside the trading on Capitol Hill when several senators, after learning about the potential for coronavirus, and COVID 
offloaded stocks in travel companies, invested in biotechnology, while continuing to reassure the public that everything was fine. So again, it's not a completely parallel situation, but it shows the institutional level through which politics and economics intersect and how COVID has become very, very impactful to abusive action. Both speak to institutional pathology and opportunity for corruption at, the, at this exact intersection. So in talking about institutions and in talking about pathology and linking it to this intersection of politics and economics and the pandemic, there's one institution that becomes immediately central in terms of what we've observed post pandemic and within COVID times as well. Um, and it's been relevant on a global scale and that's the institution of the police. And I'll start here to try and really parse out how COVID and corruption have intersected on this institutional plane. So COVID has changed the demands on and the expectations of policing at a time when resources are already greatly stretched, right? When the pandemic began, countries imposed curfews, um, installed road blo roadblocks, mandatory quarantines, every action to try and stall the spread of corruption of uh, the virus. But these protective lockdowns also created new risks for millions of people around the globe and new opportunities for abuse. It created a hyper rent seeking environment that's emerged in a lot of countries. I'll start with Venezuela. So in Venezuela, in response to COVID, officers and soldiers were demanding bribes from people who would pass roadblocks and stay out past curfew or you know, want to leave a quarantine center. Nothing abnormal, this is what they would tend to do in this area. And now that COVID has restricted movement even more, they've accelerated their rent seeking uh, practices. So they're even demanding bribes, however, for essential workers. So if you're a doctor, if you're a nurse, if you're a first responder and you're trying to get home from work or make it to the clinic or the hospital, you have to now pay for passage. That's bad enough. Now here's the rub. State, the state initiates lockdown. Police enforce the lockdown and then extract rents from those that are forced to travel despite the lockdown. And then you get government officials who now run out of these passes that are supposed to allow passage safely so the government officials begin selling fake letters of passage on the underground market. So now there's tacit collusion as they alert, these government officials alert the police that fake letters are suddenly being propagated on the market and being presented. The police then target and solicit bribes again from those carrying fake documentation. So now in essence in Venezuela, you have the extraction of rent twice. Once, from your normal passage, and actually three times, once from your normal passage, again, from purchasing these fake letters of passage, and then third time to pay for an allowance for using counterfeit or fraudulently obtained uh, documentation. So you see quickly, you have crisis, you have scarcity, you have opportunity, you have a corruption. Now, as I continue to return to this progression, remember, it's not an explanation. It's far more complex in every region that we're going to explore, but it's simply a progression that helps us conceptualize a pattern that's emerging and how we make sense of crisis and corruption, COVID and corruption. So that's Venezuela. We're still talking about the police. Let's think about Nigeria again. Now, in talk one, there was a question about SARS that came up. Uh, and I said to hold that and put a pin in that because it's gonna come back in talk three. So whoever asked that question, this example is for you. So there's been an NSARS movement in Nigeria and uh, it's also sprung up socially across the globe. And SARS essentially is the special anti-robbery squad. What happened there is in 1992, in response to rampant crime in the country, especially on major cities like, like Lagos, uh, the Nigerian government sought to build an elite police force uh, that would go after these armed robbers. If you remember the first talk, I gave that story about driving uh, overnight from Lagos to Enugu in the gray Volvo with the soldier uh, with the rifle hitting my knee. That, that was in 1991. So we're in the same period of time where SARS was enacted shortly thereafter to just try and better police the roads and you know, guard safe passage. These officers were put in plain clothes. They were given complete autonomy and became 
a more brutal face of the police. Now, soon after creating SARS, something strange happened. Abuses, robberies, and violence shot up, it didn't go down. The vigilance didn't work. How, how, what does that mean? So the autonomy that was given to these officers, because they now had complete impunity, they were able to blend in socially and maintain institutional authority. So SARS now became worse than the criminals that they were asked to apprehend in the first place. Now, waves of violence erupted from this point of their inception in 92, and you had peaks up and, up and down. Uh, but then suddenly during COVID, we reached the zenith. We reached the boiling point. Why? Well, there's been a long standing embedded structural function of extracting rents via checkpoints and traffic stops in Nigeria. And if you think about what happened with COVID, suddenly there's fewer people on the road to stop. There's fewer rents to seek out. You get a direct scarcity of resources. And then what happens? So now SARS reemerges even more powerfully. They start targeting young people, young people that they perceive to be wealthy based on a profile alone. That means if you had a smartphone or if you had an iPad or if you had a laptop or they saw you with a tattoo and nice clothes or a nice car, you were immediately labeled criminal, you were immediately stopped, you were immediately profiled and accosted. In fact, there's a video of a young motorist getting shot by a SARS officer who, after they stopped him, who then drove off in his vehicle. Think about that for a second. A police officer profiles you, shoots you, and then steals your car. Now that video went viral and Nigerians had enough. And in early October, the government pledged to disband SARS. But then you fast forward to the end of that month, October 20th, 2020, almost 50 people were shot and killed by armed forces in Nigeria at Lake Itoge Bridge in Lagos. Now they were protesting for good reason. After SARS was shut down, a new unit emerged shortly thereafter, rebranded as SWAT. So instead of SARS, now you have SWAT. But then that new unit was comprised of the same members and the same officers with the same mandate as SARS. In fact, this would be the fourth time that a ban occurred for SARS and a rebranding and a relaunch of a similar unit emerged. So if we go back and think about the perfunctory role of police and armed forces with regard to checkpoints in Nigeria and think about what happens when crisis creates fewer people to check, creates fewer bribes to attain, creates more scarce resources, creates what some people would call opportunities and ends up in corruption. And unfortunately in this instance, ends up in extreme violence and death. But we see how this institution has now been placed at this intersection and how COVID and crisis has been an accelerant to behavior that was longstanding, but now we see it boil over, right? We see it completely reach new heights. So there's one more example I wanna provide about the institution of the police, and that's in Israel. So we think about the Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, during this COVID period, he has activated police to quell protests against abusive action. But if we go back to pre-COVID and what was going on for him personally and politically, he was the first sitting Israeli Prime Minister to be indicted. When COVID broke out, Netanyahu was on trial for three cases of bribery, fraud, and breach of trust. So fortunately or unfortunately, you have a pandemic and what does he immediately do? Easy. If he was set for trial, shuts everything down. Courts are shut down until further notice. So in response to public starts protesting, and in response to police intensify their vigilance, there are more arrests, there are more violence. At one point, protesters actually assembled outside Netanyahu's residence at his home, and police quickly dispersed the crowd with water cannons, with violence, uh, and Netanyahu himself swiftly then passed a law stating that groups of 20 people or more cannot congregate during this time. So a police were then deployed after the fact, after this in plain clothes, they started confiscating cell phones. They started kettling protesters, which just means, you know, sectioning them off and trapping them in place, almost like how you would corral cattle. Instead of, instead of cattle, we're talking about people and human lives. And it created a new antagonism between the Israeli police and the Israeli people. 
an antagonism that was traditionally reserved for immigrants, outsiders, uh, Ethiopians, Palestinians, whomever. And now the normal act of leaving your home was seen as criminal and as civil disobedience. And all of this was coordinated and implemented at the behest of Netanyahu as a consequence to prior corruption and as a way to try and evade persecution for those acts and in direct response to pressures following the social pandemic. So these examples of the institution of the police are aimed to show how public institutions converge around crisis like COVID and create opportunities for abusive and corrupt behavior to become even more magnified and present. So as we've been talking about pathology, institutions, the intersection of politics, economics, and COVID, we see how the police can serve as a very, very clear example of the pattern and the progression that I talked about. Now, I know that we can't travel during this time of COVID. We have to, you know, social distance and be in place, but I would ask all of you to quickly come along with me for a moment, and we're gonna go on a bit of a COVID and corruption world tour. And I wanna really just hit certain places on the map and unearth abuses and in institutional pathology and just see kind of how they land and see how COVID has impacted around the world. And then for fun, if you remember our lecture uh, last time, and we were talking about Transparency International and the corruption ratings, uh, you know, ranking countries on a scale. So for fun, we'll also see where these countries each rank on the corruption scale. So Israel, for example, ranked 35th out of 198. So on this scale, the lower your score, the less corrupt you're perceived to be. And the scale goes from highly corrupt to very clean, which is also unusual. I'm not quite sure what they mean by very clean, but highly corrupt or very clean. 198 being the highest corrupt nation and one being the most clean. Israel was 35. Uh, we talked about Nigeria, that was 146. So you start to see the stratification of rankings and what that means. But just keep that in the back of your head as we go through our COVID and corruption world tour. We're gonna start in Africa and we've talked about Nigeria. Let's jump to the Dominican or the Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm getting ahead. We're gonna go to Latin America later. <laughs> We're still in Africa. The Democratic Republic of Congo ranks 186 on this list of 198 countries. So in the DRC, during COVID, or in response to it, a group of nurses and doctors were forced to work for months, months without pay, even though the government had petitioned for and received $27 million of funds specifically targeted to essential workers. They were supposed to pay these essential workers with these funds, and for months and months and months, they haven't seen a cent and are still required to work. Where that money has gone, your guess is as good as mine, but it's akin to what we saw in Haiti where 14 billion, just no one can account for it. So in the Congo, we see this coming from COVID. If we travel a little bit Northeast from the Congo to Kenya, ranks 180th on this Transparency International scale. They had hospital staff, reports of hospital staff who were forcing patients to buy masks before entering the hospital and receiving care. So not that you had to wear a mask to come in, you can have a mask but you had to buy the hospital's mask. So imagine having to rush to the hospital during a time like this, and then you're greeted at the door with an exorbitant fee for a mask, even if you're already wearing one. And they refuse care, and they re refuse entry to anyone that doesn't then purchase the hospital's mask. Now you can call that safety precautions, or you can call that price gouging, or you can call it a form of corruption. Maybe it's all three, but this is what we see happening as an example in Kenya. So in, Niger in Africa, which is the home of exceptional corruption, you see very low score or very high scores rather on this scale. And surely those sorts of abuses are gonna show up in other countries, right? Because you know, Africa is the epicenter of corruption and the epicenter of abuse of power. And we will probably see the most pathological institutional behavior in this setting. Well, let's find out. Jump back on the plane and let's go to Latin America. Now, Latin America isn't necessarily seen as negatively or portrayed with the same debilitating connotation as perhaps Africa is when it comes to corruption, uh, but they're still abusive. They're, it's almost like JV corruption. They're not as abusive, uh, but they're still very abusive. But let's explore 
what's been going on in Latin America amidst the COVID crisis with regard to corruption. So in Ecuador, ranks 93rd on this Transparency International scale. Again, one being very clean, 198 being most highly corrupt. So 93rd, somewhere in the middle. The former president in Ecuador was involved in a large price gouging scheme to sell body bags at 15 times the market rate, which again, we've seen price gouging in other areas, but they skipped preventative care altogether. They skipped the treatment with masks and ventilators and went straight to presumed <laughs> eventuality of death, which is frightening to think about that they would be selling body bags at 15 times the market rate. That's what, an example of the abuse that we saw in Ecuador. If we go down to Venezuela, and they actually ranked on the higher scale in terms of highly corrupt uh, for Latin America, 173rd. There are reports in Venezuela that involve state-funded agreements to house coronavirus patients in hotels that were owned by the mayor of Buenos Aires. Now, imagine, use your imagination, that an elected official also owns a chain of hotels. And this official then used these hotels to house patients or quarantine citizens with allocated funds to address issues of the pandemic and figured out a way, probably wasn't too hard, to house them in the hotels that he owned or had a financial interest in. Example of what type of abuses are going on in Venezuela. And then lastly, we'll go to El Salvador, 113th on this scale. And there've been reports of sextortion or sexual extortion where public officials and aid workers are actually demanding sex in exchange for medical services, which again is another element of abuse of power. And you see the varieties of corruption and the varieties of abuses, but we see them consistently as an aftermath or an aftershock of COVID where these pathologies become more and more pronounced. We saw it in Africa, we saw it in Latin America. Now those are two regions that have been historically pinned and labeled as hotbeds for corruption. But what happens when we go to Europe, right? Pack our bags, go across the Atlantic, let's get to Europe. Now, on the scale of Transparency, Transparency International, Europe has consistently boasted the most of the very clean countries on the scale. The top 10, in fact, eight or nine are consistently comprised of European nations. So our expectation would be no corruption or moderate corruption or very, very low levels of corruption. Very clean, right? Let's start in Italy. Italy ranks number 51. In Italy, it recently came to light that public contract for $32 million of face masks, worth of face masks, was awarded to a agricultural company that specializes in greenhouse. Never produced a mask prior to the pandemic. How can a company that has never produced a mask now get awarded a contract to produce 32 million of them at the time at the most dire time and the most increased need, the most pressing need. How does that happen? Remember, we also talked briefly about culture being a reason or explanation for corruption. Now, I would point to culture here in Italy's case, but there's certainly something to be said about seeing these abuses across regions and across communities and across different uh, places around the globe. So in Italy, we have public contracts that aren't warranted. In Romania, which ranks number 70 on our scale or Transparency International scale, the normal bidding process was suspended and replaced with backdoor deals. Similarly, a small company that produces tobacco and cigarettes somehow scored state contracts of over $15 million to produce specialized N95 masks at more than twice the market rate. I don't know what producing tobacco and alcohol allows you to do in, with regards to medical supplies, but apparently in Romania, they, they might be one and the same, who knows? But remember that corruption is both real and illusory. So some of these practices are very, very easy to see. If you're in Kenya and you wanna go into the hospital or some hospitals, they force you right there, pay for our mask or you can't get it. And now if you're in Italy and Romania, you just do backdoor deals through the government and allocating contracts for up to 50, 25, $15 million. What happens in France? France is number 23, one of the lowest in terms of very clean, in terms of corruption on that scale. Well, in France, 
several groups have been arrested at Charles de Gaulle Airport for selling fake negative COVID tests for up to 400, 400 euros a piece for travelers coming in and out of the country. So you can think about it, you land in Paris, you can then get the earbuds that you probably forgot on the plane, uh, get yourself a neck pillow and get yourself a negative COVID test just in case you need support or, or land somewhere else. These are the kind of the abuses that we see consistently, uh, even in areas and countries that have been perceived to be very clean, to be moderately or show no dis, um, illustrations of corruption. Couple more in Europe. What happens in Russia? So it's interesting in Russia, they are 137. So in terms of Europe, they're looked at as, see, as being more corrupt than most, but ventilators in St. Petersburg were manufactured by a company that was run by a man named Sergei Chemozov, who was a very close ally of Vladimir Putin. And his company was repeatedly awarded contract after contract, millions and millions and millions of rubles to produce ventilators. They then took those same ventilators that they produced, they were confiscated, and these oligarchs and high placed people in society turned their mansions into clinics, complete with doctors and nurses, just in case one of them fell sick, because God forbid, they would have to now go into the state owned hospitals with which they were just awarded millions and millions of dollars to supply ventilators to. You can see the continued intersectionality and you can see the continued push towards abusive actions and behavior that are corrupt, stemming from COVID, stemming from pandemic, stemming from crisis. Finally, in Hungary, ranks number 70, uh, the prime minister leveraged COVID to extend a state of emergency to allow his office to make unilateral decisions, pass different laws, and sidestep oversight of parliament to improve his political position. So similar to Netanyahu in Israel, using your platform, using this institution for your own personal gain as a result of pressures mounted from the crisis, uh, both socially and economically. So going through Europe, we've seen clientelism, we've seen cronyism, we've seen fraud. We've also seen relatively low scores in terms of corruption, but we see it. I, I repeatedly say it's real and illusory, but the examples are there. And it just harkens back to the discussion of what are these perceptions and what are these subjectivities really based off of? We see the same or similar practices, similar abuses, irrespective of what your passport says, irrespective of the colors on your flag, especially at a time like social global pandemic with COVID, you will see the emergence of opportunities and abuses and corruption. Finally, I know you guys are all tired from all are traveling back to the United States, which also ranks 23rd on this corruption scale, tied with France actually. Um, what's happening in the United States? So on a federal level, we can also see similar abuses, right? So FEMA awarded $55 million of contracts to develop and supply masks to a Delaware company with no history of producing medical equipment. Wait a minute, that sounds a lot like our liquor and cigarette company in Romania, or the greenhouse company in Italy, or the myriad of companies throughout Africa and the developing world, which are illegally awarded contracts, but how is FEMA now awarding contracts to a Delaware-based company on the same premise, perpetrating the same exact thing? There's also been reports that up to $275 million of pandemic-related aid has been awarded to more than 100 companies that are owned and operated by major donors to President Trump and his election efforts. Sounds very, very similar to Vladimir Putin awarding contracts to his oligarchs in his circle for ventilators. His parallels are there. And again, I, I wanna highlight how COVID has caused a lot of these abusive acts that have been clandestine, that have been behind the cloak, that have been maybe invisible to become more and more visible. Not that they created them, but they've all, in a sense, magnified the behavior due to the scarcity caused by crisis to where now opportunities result in abuse and corruption. 
also in the United States, and speaking of the CARES Act, which was worth trillions of dollars, right? In response to COVID at one point, uh, then President Trump said, I don't need oversight, I am oversight. And to this, he was really talking about the inspector general who was supposed to report the administration and oversee the bailout fund. But once he saw that there was gonna be a little bit of friction, Trump had him fired, replaced him with a member of his impeachment defense team and carried on. Now there's other modes of political and institutional pressures that I wanna quickly highlight. If we remember the post office bailout that occurred over the summer, the loan came for the post office several provisions uh, and several requirements, presumably from political motivations of the president and executed from the treasury secretary. Uh, one such action was firing the postmaster general and replacing him with a huge donator to Trump's presidential campaign. Now, these instances of cronyism are vast and we see them quite obviously in this time um, but far more hidden in other times. And these are ways in which crisis like COVID shines a light on features and modalities in our institutions that are already existing, but now become pressure points and expose behaviors due to scarcity, et cetera. Not to mention the leveraging of the pandemic to influence voter participation and electoral outcomes. That's a whole nother conversation, but you can quickly see the line and the intersection of where politics, economics, and COVID has now collided and power is abused very, very blatantly and very, very consistently. Now, it's not just on a grand scale, if we're thinking about uh, COVID in the United States and corruption. Um, it's not just on Capitol Hill with the president on a federal level. We think locally as well, right? Local cities have repeatedly admitted needing to recalibrate collection efforts due to terrible 2020 and financial shortfalls and um, gaps due to COVID. So in Chicago, the mayor of Chicago, Mayor Lightfoot has proposed speeding cameras that will automatically issue tickets for infractions of over six miles an hour, six miles an hour. If you're going 31 in a 25, instant ticket. And if you're going over 11 miles an hour, a hundred dollar ticket. You're on a highway and you go 61 in a 50, automatic ticket. Now the motivation might be safety, sure, but the impetus is clearly to recover lost revenue from the COVID shutdown. Now, I don't know what you would call that, recalibrating, reappropriating. It feels like rent seeking that we're just going to increase the use of speeding cameras at six mile and five mile increments. Now, will these tickets stick? Who knows, maybe, maybe not. But hey, you can always go to court and they can always downgrade it and your violation will be expunged and now you just have to pay court costs. And if you remember our conversation from last time, this is another mode of rent seeking that exists every day. In our everyday lives, we think nothing, nothing of it. But suddenly you see that going six miles an hour is immediately caught by a camera and now you're issued a ticket. You see how the pandemic has now shifted these already existing abuses in a way that becomes more and more evident and relevant to our everyday lives. Not to mention in New York City, 750 new parking meters have been deployed around the city and 100 new workers have been reassigned to intentionally intensify ticket writing duties. I mean, there, no one is hiding what's going on. You can go to any city around the, around the country, any county, any state. What is happening is money and revenue has been lost due to the pandemic. We have to figure out ways to increase and make up for that revenue. Now. Typically, that doesn't sound harmful at all until you start putting those pressures and violating, viol in, in terms of the violations you were supposed to police, you're now violating and, we're, and increasing your efforts to maybe artificially make up for those lost gains. Again, scarcity of resources, opportunity, abuse, corruption. Now, on all levels we've seen in all regions, especially with a punctuated moment like COVID, crisis, scarcity, opportunity, and corruption. I keep repeating it because it's so relevant to this uh, contestation that we've been discussing from definitions to comparison and measurements to now uh, institutional pathology. But there's a huge irony that animates our discussion that we haven't really talked about. If we think about one of the most accepted origin stories for the crisis for COVID, 
COVID might itself have come from corrupt practices in the first place. So if you take the story as fact, the origin of SARS-CoV-2 was from a fact uh, from a market in Wuhan, China, that was engaging in corrupt and illegal trade of exotic wildlife, where a zootonic disease then emerged and transferred to human beings and then spread like wildfire throughout the world. Now, the fact that this pandemic that has been an accelerant to corruption was itself caused by corruption is a very, very bizarre sort of inception. But you start to see the intersection, you start to see the connections, you start to see how when you're discussing and analyzing something like corruption, there typically isn't a origin, start and end. Even if we trace a punctuated moment like COVID to a start, you see that that start was motivated and created from corrupt practices in the first place. So it all feeds into this continuum and it all feeds into these patterns and trying to understand corruption becomes very, very difficult in that way. But we also can see very insightful takeaways and conclusions when we start parsing out institutional pathology and looking at a broader plane, looking at a higher level and seeing how these abuses intersect with politics, economics, and impact society. So I wanna parallel as we're coming to a close, one element that I have purposefully not included in the progression that I've been discussing, right? If we think about how all these moments of disaster and aid result in waves of corruption, I wanna also think about if we talk about crisis, we talk about scarcity, opportunity and corruption, there's another milestone in that continuum, and that's capital. If you've been paying attention, you'd probably have noted it yourself. Well, what about the capital? What about the money? So in my own corruption research, the role of transnational cap capital was pivotal, crucial in characterizing the institutional transformations that led to corruption in Nigeria. Similarly, it's very crucial, and I would argue that once you have transnational capital in any form, and you introduce unchecked, unmonitored, unaccounted for monies into a system in crisis, there most likely will be abuse and corruption. We go back to the examples of Haiti. We go to the example of Sri Lanka. Wherever you want to go, and whenever in history, if there were disaster aid programs, you have to then look at the conclusion, you scratch your head, where did the monies go? There's abuse, there's corruption. Now think about this aid in another context. Right? Not about disasters or responding to an earthquake or something that happened. Think about aid given to developing nations across the world throughout history. So again, forget the earthquakes and the mudslides and the tsunamis, but think about development, aid given just for development. Whether it's federal uh, foreign direct investment, IMF loans, development finance, there has been a constant and consistent introduction of unchecked monies into systems that were designated as being in crisis. So that abuse and corruption followed scarcity and capital should be no surprise, right? We see it historically and we see it presently in the world. The social pandemic has exposed institutional pathologies whereby crisis gives rise to scarcity. Scarcity is met with the infusion of capital. This infusion presents myriad opportunities and new logics seen as attractive. And that new conception manifests as abuses of power and goes across political and economic institutions. Going back to Baron Rothschild, when there's blood in the streets by land, I don't know if he ever considered what happens when there's no one in the streets. <laughs> what becomes the logic for building wealth? Well, we've seen with COVID, crisis, scarcity, capital, opportunity, corruption. In sum, these linkages exemplify and reveal the unabated relationship between COVID and corruption. And I can only hope that across these three talks, I've elucidated and illuminated some features of corruption that might not have been resonant to you, relevant to you, or immediately present to you. Um, and I hope that you've enjoyed the talk. And I would love to take your questions on this part three.
Okay, Nandi, thank you very much for a really fascinating third lecture where you brought everything together um, and helped us understand the times we are living through in 2020. Um, I just wanna open it up now for questions. Um, and you can type your questions in the Q&A place there and I will read them or summarize them and, and then we can have a discussion from there on out. Um, so um, we look forward to the questions and let me just go to um, um, the first question. Excellent lecture series, exclamation point. Want to add that. Can there please be a part four? How's that for a lead off question? Pretty good, right? <laughs> Well, that, that's not for me to decide, but if there is interest, I will certainly continue the conversation. We would love to host you for that, I'm sure. So thanks um, for that question. Um, just wanted to open it up. Um, uh, while we wait for questions, I have a question. Um, I want to follow up on your, your really interesting observation about how in crisis, in times of crisis at times, the a corruption becomes uh, increasingly overt as opposed to in other instances, certain uh, types of corruption are more hidden or underground or uh, harder to see. And so I guess that does raise the question of a silver lining there that if there are certain practices that are becoming more open to the human eye, do you think that there's more opportunity uh, to fight corruption uh, because we can see it more um, uh, because uh, we can see it in ways that uh, we weren't able to before? Interesting question. I, you would presume yes, right? If the, if the practices are now being revealed, if they're more apparent or more evident or more overt, as you put it, should we now have mechanisms to fight them? The only thing that I would couch that in is that during times of crisis, the rules seem to change, right? You're now playing on a different chessboard. So you can't really take that as an example to then go forward in times of calm or times of, you know, regular, you know, no crisis, right? Mm -hmm. So if, you know, certain protocols are being overlooked or certain procedures are now being enacted to respond to crisis, that's not status quo. So to respond to corruption, once those kind of, um, erode back to normalcy, where does that leave your newly implemented procedures if they're not applicable in a normal state? So yes, I would think that there would be ways to take advantage of the fact that they're now more apparent, but long-term, how do they stay and maintain relevance uh, in a state that's not necessarily in crisis? Mm -hmm. So it just seems that this enduring problem with fighting corruption is in identifying it in the first place though, right? I mean, so, and I guess, you know, an analogy to human rights abuses, uh, human rights abuses, war crimes, for example, are often hidden as well, but not in the same way, right? Um, so it's not just a question of documentation in the form of corruption. It's often uncovering secret transfers of money, disappearing mm -hmm. funds. So in a non-crisis environment, um, and uh, maybe this is too policy-oriented of a question, and it's hard to have a total answer, but um, because the problem of corruption is often illusory, what is one thing we can do to help shine a light on that other <laughs> than to have a crisis, like you know, where it becomes more visible? Yeah, it's, I mean, that's one of the most difficult, like equally, it's equally difficult to combat corruption as it is to try and explain and define it. You know, I, I like to say that trying to combat corruption is like playing a never ending game of whack-a-mole blindfolded in the dark. You know, how do you even identify your target? How do you hit your target? And if you do, how do you continue to hit your target? Right. But I do think that it's very, very, like everything that I've been discussing with corruption, context specific. So there are measures that have worked. There are transparency measures that seem to be effective in certain areas. Um, it's taking those measures and seeing how you can adapt them in this context and with the practices that you're dealing with. 
So if Denmark is seen as the most clean or the least corrupt country in the world, it's not as easy as saying, well, what is Denmark? What do Denmark's institutions look like? What has Denmark done to stave off corruption? Let me take that and let me go to Venezuela and do the same thing. Sure. That can't work, right? There's no copy and paste. But if we see and we notice where corruption has been reduced or has been effective, understanding how and what it's been addressing and using that same method to try and then implement in the context that you're dealing with might result in some positive gains as far as eradicating or at least minimizing the abuses of power, especially institutionally, because these things are embedded. These things are structural. Got it. Okay, thank you so much for that very thoughtful answer. We have a question uh, in the Q&A. Um, over time, have countries that are seen as very corrupt been able to change? So this is maybe a big historical yeah. sweep there. And uh, yeah. Yes, but change in whose eyes, right? If you ask Transparency International, there was a time that Botswana ranked at the very lowest levels of corruption, meaning they were seen as highly corrupt. And within a span of five to 10 years after receiving IMF uh, development capital, they then were seen as being mid and moderately corrupt. And then they oscillated back and forth just based on perception. So can they change you know, subjectively? Sure, anything can change subjectively. Holistically and objectively, that's a harder thing to pin down. Um, but more broadly, without using an example and without you know, calling into question the measurement uh, indices, um, I do think that change is possible, but over time, right? Again, the United States, as much as the examples that I've been given of corruption are still there, are still present, we're not in the 19th century, right? We're nowhere near the levels of abuses that we saw go on. We might see higher numbers in terms of dollar amount, but in terms of actual inter in uh, interactions or encountering corruption, there is a change. Unfortunately, I think when you do see a change, it just becomes more and more invisible and you can become less and less attached to those acts. And that's probably because they're now existing on such a higher plane that you don't even see them. But corruption, remember, is always going to exist. It's always going to be present. Uh, it's just the degrees in which you can actually observe them and notice them and hopefully try and deal with them that changes. Okay, uh, great. great. Um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm just looking at the, uh, at the q and I, I think we have time for um, uh, at least one more. Um, the one question maybe is along the lines of the last one, how can corruption be mitigated not only in crisis situations like the coronavirus pandemic, but in a non-crisis situation? So that kind of follows up um, um, somewhat on the previous inquiry yeah. there. No, these are all great questions. I like to stay away from broad sweeping statements of this is how to do it, whether crisis or non-crisis. I think the more important question is, if you have a specific context, if you have a specific country, if you say, how can we address corruption in Mexico that has been ex exacerbated over the last 10 years due to this, then you can target a response and it's meaningful. Um, I'm always hesitant to say, all we have to do is build this, or all we have to do is be more transparent. All we have to do is make more laws because it's never that simple. So I know that doesn't really answer the question, but your interrogation has to be very, very specific. And then you develop a response that's just as specific. And even then, because things change and dynamics change, you might have to adapt and evolve with that change to continue to combat it. You know, it's a, it's a constant evolving fight to try and combat and mitigate corruption. It's not something that you put in place and walk away. You know, it's not like a crock pot where you set it and then you're done, you're good. You have to always monitor, you have to always continue to evolve and innovate. Okay, thanks for that. Um, here is a question, uh, an observation and a question. It seems that people are very forgiving of corruption. Do you see that trend? Um, and I guess that might just refer to people and I would add also, sometimes states in their foreign policy, depending on their interests, but maybe that's a separate add on there. Yeah, no, absolutely. People are forgiving of corruption largely because they don't have to interact with corruption. When you talk about these stories and you talk about these exorbitant figures, 500 million, 14 billion, it's not real to most people. So they kind of brush it off as nothing, right? 
Um, but I would also argue that not only are people forgiving of corruption in certain contexts, they're almost appreciative or they um, exalt corrupt acts in a way that's almost like heroism. You know, certain areas and times in the Philippines, in Nigeria, in Brazil, the public is almost like, it's almost like a bizarre Robin Hood where they're not getting anything from it. But it's like, if somebody else can beat the state or defy the odds and come away with this financial windfall, maybe that leaves something for me to aspire to. Because again, you have scarcity of resources. So the logic then changes to where if I can't go to school, work hard, get a job and feed my family, then I have to do something else. And if that guy did it, then maybe I can do it as well. And now you have hope to aspire to something. So not only forgiving corruption, there's times where corruption becomes aspirational, which is also very, very dangerous. Interesting. Okay. Um, that is a interesting note uh, to kind of end on. I, th I think we will end it there we're right at three, but I do want to say we had a, a question uh, for someone who's interested in finding your previous talks and this talk um, we will, we do have recordings of your two previous talks on the YouTube channel on the School of Politics and Global Study website and your third talk will also be available. So we invite people to go there as well. We're just right after three o'clock. So Namdi, thank you so much on behalf of ASU uh, for your three uh, fabulous talks. Very, very interesting. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully someday soon. Thank you so much. Hopefully. And thanks Thank to the audience much. for coming today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.